Oh, okay. Thanks very much, Mark. No worries. Um, great to see so many of you here again. We've topped uh, 345 now, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, these events are really are taking off now. And it's a great way for us to all keep in touch. Uh, and we've sort of got some fantastic speakers coming up also tonight. I will now, without further ado, pass over to Kelly, who will introduce you to tonight's speaker, Chris. Kelly. Yeah, good evening, everybody. I'll, we're now top 350, so things are looking really good. Must be a lot of steam enthusiasts out there tonight. Um, all things wonderful railways. I'm going to, without ado, hand over to Chris, star of um, North Yorkshire Moor Railway on Channel 5, um, and he's going to talk about steam trains and all things that uh, join along with them. So over to you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's my job, obviously, to bore you this evening. The the only uh, the rule I ask is that before, just before you fall asleep, if you could just turn your camera off, it doesn't knock my confidence too much. So that would be great. Thanks a lot. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the railway. I, and before I start, I better start sharing my screen. I'm uh, I'm pretty useless at these kind of things, so you're going to have to be tolerant with me while I do so. And let me just see, has that come up? Let me just ask a question to Mark. Has that come up, Mark? I can I can see that. Very good. All right, that's fine. So we're away. We're away on that one. So uh, as the title says, it's uh, Chris Price from Little to Large. This is not a comment on my waistline. It's a comment on the uh, the railways that I've managed over several years. I'll talk a little bit about myself to those of you who don't know me. And then I'll talk a little about each railway individually, uh, what they mean to me, how they've helped me develop it, uh, into the general manager of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, which I'm proud to say is one of the biggest heritage railways in the world and probably the biggest in Europe, certainly when it comes to um, passenger numbers. Um, so bear with me. I'll talk you through it. It'll be fairly relaxed. I'll, I'll look at the chat as we go on. If you think of a question, by all means, put it there. I can't guarantee that my eyes will flick to it all the time, but I'll do my best. So, so without further ado, Chris Price from Little to Large. Uh, what am I going to talk about? Um, well, fundamentally, me in the first instance, which is the easiest thing to talk about. So thank you very much for allowing me to do so. Um, I'm going to talk about myself. As I said, I'm going to talk about the three railways that I have been able to manage in my career. Um, and also... What are the current challenges? And it wouldn't be a Zoom presentation uh, in 2021 without talking about COVID-19. So I think we'll have the fun of that. It'll be a shame to leave it out. Um, and what we are doing, what we, where we're going as a railway, and what does the railway hold for us? I'll also talk a little bit, if I may, about what I think the future holds for heritage railways. One of the big challenges at the moment, as we're all probably aware of now, is the fact that we're no longer mining coal in Great Britain. Uh, and of course, that has, has an issue, that is an issue. The heritage railways are very much built on coal. So if you will forgive me, I will talk through that as well. So anyway, this great opportunity to talk about myself. Who could want for more? Um, and you may be surprised by my first screen. My first screen, unfortunately, is is something that is very special to me. And if we're honest, an awful lot of rail enthusiasts out there would not be rail enthusiasts had it not been for the Reverend Audrey and the Thomas the Tank Engine stories. And I'm no exception to that. Uh, from a very early age, I was married, uh, sorry, I was married. I was the son of a, an engineer who uh, indoctrinated me. There's no other way to say it. By horse feeding me a Reverend Audrey story every night in the formative years. Um, I still have all 26 copies of the Reverend Audrey's books and I'm a bit of a snob. I won't go beyond 26. After that, his son started writing, writing them and after that, it just got terrible. So I'm afraid I'm a bit of an old stick in the mud when it comes to Reverend Audrey. I very much uh, stay with the traditional. So. I thought I'd just start with that. I think there's probably a lot of us out there, if we're absolutely honest, that actually have started our, rail, our love of railways through the Thomas the Tank Engine story. The thing that really draws me to them 
is that all of them are written about real events. And so therefore they're real. You can actually, if you do the research, you can actually find just about every Thomas story that ever happened is actually related to an accident or an incident on the big railways. So I think that's what makes them special to me. So anyway, moving on, I am. I'm 55 years old at this moment. I know I look in my 40s, but you know we have to we have to live with that. Uh, we can't all be beautiful. Um, I, I uh, so I'm, I'm 55. My starting on my, off my career as uh, after a, a a very failed period at school. I, I, I despite my uh, the teacher's best interest, I did my best to thwart them, and I think I did a pretty good job of it. So when I came out, I was left with little option in the early 80s, uh, what, I, what I was going to do. So I, I walked along to my Lotus Career Information Centre uh, and became an RAF, uh, and eventually RAF air, aircraft technician, did nine years in the Air Force. I came out as a corporal. Um, other notable corporals that have had reasonable success in management, of course, is Adolf Hitler which is something I don't shout about predominantly, but it, it is something I do bring up from now, now and again, just to remind people where my credentials come from. Um, I have two grown up children, as I said, the gift that keeps on taking. Any of you that have gone through the period of having grown up children know exactly what I'm talking about at this moment in time. I am traditionally the banker of mom and dad. Um, I've worked in railway preservation for 40 years. Um, I'm quite proud of that fact. Uh, I started as a 15 year old uh, on the Tower Thin Railway. I will go into depth about talking about the Tower Thin Railway when I come to it, but predominantly um, that formed my life because although I was working, my love was heritage railways. And the more I got into heritage railways, the more I fell in love with them. And if I'm honest with you, it isn't the steam locomotives, it isn't the carriages or the track or anything like that. It's purely the people. On the whole, I have found that in railway preservation, the people I come across on a day-to-day basis, on the whole, are decent human beings. Uh, I think this is something that I could also draw a line with, with volunteering generally. If you're prepared to give your time for the benefit of others, that makes you a good bloke or a good lady in my book, apologies. I have been very lucky to be the general manager of three railways. The Fairbourne, which is a very small little railway in Wales. The Tarfin, which is claimed to fame being that it was the first preserved railway in Great Britain. Also the railway which I should have uh, was, a volunteer, was volunteered on by the Reverend Audrey. And finally, I was very lucky enough, coming up for six years ago now, very lucky uh, to be chosen to be the general manager of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, which I take great pride in. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway, I believe, is certainly in, in, in the top echelons of heritage railways. Um, it, um, it encapsulates what is a heritage railway. It's a microcosm of, of, of what railways were in the past. And I think we deliver that very, very well. Um, through that, I've gone on to join the board of the Trade Association of the Heritage Railways in Great Britain, and I've become a uh, vice chair of the Heritage Railways Association. It's very nice to see that Colin Wright, uh, father in law, knew, knew Thomas, I think, or the engine or the, or the person, I'm not sure. I'm, I, we'll, we'll, we'll find out that, that, that out later. Anyway, um, vice chair of the Heritage Railways Association, very proud again to be associated with that. The Heritage Railways Association is there to bring all the Heritage Railways under one umbrella. This brings me into all sorts of forums from visiting a small railway in Cornwall right up to attending the Houses of Parliament uh, on the all party parliamentary group for Heritage Railways. Currently, there are big things being talked about, predominantly the use of coal. We're lobbying very hard in government to make sure that uh, we're, we're not forgotten. We're, we've also got to be aware of our, uh, of our environmental credentials. And it's making sure that we're seen as a responsible organization when it comes to the environment, not just somebody heaping black stuff into a fire and, and enjoying it. Um, before that, uh, although I was still a volunteer in Heritage Railways, I was the manager of the States manager for the Workers' Education Association. Some of you might be aware of the Workers' Education Association. It's a national organization but I was a states manager for the Welsh area. I was responsible for 16 offices 
and I went on before that to, uh, sorry, after that to project manage the merger of the North and South Wales branches of the Workers' Education Association. A few little shots of Chris Price, kind of semi on or semi off duty. You have from top left, what I love doing the best, which is driving steam engines on the Tarpin Railway. Uh, I love my job, it is very special to me, but it is my job. My hobby is driving steam engines on the Tarpin Railway. I made the mistake of turning my hobby into the job for the two years. I was general manager of the Tarpin, but more of that later. Secondly, going around clockwise, my second love, motorcycling. I haven't, I've only fallen off twice, and it, neither time it put me in hospital, but my wife is assuring me that I need to lower my mileage on an annual basis. You will notice my motorbike is a slow one, not one of these ridiculous squids, stupidly quick, inevitably dead, as I call them. Um, we then move into uh, my, some of my other volunteering, which on the standard gauge, that was on the mid hans Railway. Again, me driving on the Taufin Railway. Below that is my day job. I'm getting more into my day job now. This was when the North Yorkshire Moors, where I was proud to take the Yorkshire White Rose Award at a recent award ceremony. And you see some of my staff being, um, shall we say, well behaved, I think would be the word. Um, then you go on to the Fairbourne Railway. My time on the Fairbourne Railway as general manager, as you can see, a different scale completely, a much smaller organisation, a much smaller locomotives. Again, a bit me in the a, a me in the corporate kind of role as the managing director as I was then before we became general manager and before we changed the job title. And finally, my real love. Bottom left, when we beat the mighty Arsenal 2-1, February the 11th, 2011, when Birmingham City were once once, just once, we had some limelight. Now, unfortunately, we're languishing in the bottom of the championship, but we will talk about low. If anybody wants to drop me a message about that, that'll probably have me in tears. Um, moving on. My railways. Now, for those of you who don't want to listen to me prattling on now, you can hit the mute button and you can quite happily look at the pictures because we have quite a lot of pretty pictures here. So... For those of you I am boring, I apologise, but I hope the entertainment on the screen will um, give you some benefit. We start off the Fairbourne Railway. The Fairbourne Railway, I think, was where I cut my teeth. I'd been a volunteer since the, uh, the early 80s on the Tower thing. And when I came out of the Air Force in 1994, I was looking for something to do. And I went to work for the Tower thing. And after a while, I thought, I quite fancy a bit of this management. So... The general managership on the Fairbourne Railway came up. The Fairbourne Railway is one and a quarter miles, sorry, about one and three quarter miles long, and it runs on the Mid Wales coast near Barmouth. You can see the famous Barmouth Bridge in the background of that photograph. Um, it had many guises, but it was basically a little beach railway. Nothing more, nothing less. And we had at that time four members of staff, of which I was the general manager. So it wasn't the most auspicious job, but it was I was still the general manager and I was proud of it. And I cut my teeth there. And what I can say to my staff on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, now I have 114 of them, what I can say to them is that being the general manager of the Fairbourne Railway gave me the honour of being able to choose exactly when I clean the toilets. And I think that, that kind of... Brings people down to earth, brings me down to earth a little bit, and reminds me that although we're a kind of running one of the biggest heritage railways in Europe, that at the end of the day you still have to be prepared to now and again clean the toilet. I worked for the Fairbourne Railway for about nine years. Uh, great fun. Um, I remember going to a, an ORR seminar when it was talking about the risks of derailment on railways. And somebody looked at me across this seminar and said, so, so what's the risk to you at the Fairbourne Railway? I said, well, the biggest risk is putting your back out, lifting the coach back on. But apart from that, uh, I don't see, see many other worries. So we, we, we enjoyed ourselves there and it was great. From there, however, uh, I realised that whilst I was very good at running a little railway in Wales, what I wasn't very good at was management. So... Towards the end of my tenure there, I got uh, the opportunity to apply for a job of working for the estates manager for the Work Workers' Education Association. And that's where I honed my general management skills. It's also where I went across to college and 
did my management training and everything else, which, which brought me to the attention of the railway I'd been volunteering on and for a short period of time been a, a member of staff in the workshop of. Uh, of the Tarathin Railway, and I was invited uh, about, for about nine years. Sorry, I'm sorry. I was invited about eight years ago to um, become the general manager of the Tarathin Railway. For those of you who don't know the Tarathin Railway, I am going to give you a bit of history. The Tarathin Railway was the first narrow gauge in the world designed specifically for steam locomotive haulage. It is also quite rare in the preservation world in the fact that that photograph there is all the original stock. That photograph was taken in about 2010. Actually, that's true, about 2015. And that photograph could have been taken on the opening day of 1865. The railway is unique in its ability to absolutely portray the railway as it was on the opening day. Uh, the combined total of the, of, the, of the stock you see in that photograph must be in the region of 800, 900 years. It is absolutely spectacular from that point of view. It also holds the honour of being the first preserved railway in the world. It was preserved predominantly by a guy called Tom Rolt, who also went on to make his mark in several transport functions. One of those was the canals. He founded, he was co-founder of the Inland Waterway Association and the Vintage Sports Car Club. So this guy had a reputation for founding clubs. What he wasn't very good at was staying with them. He, he fell out with every one of the clubs, including the South End Railway, that he started. So he was obviously somebody who, liked, who started up things on democratic principles and then didn't like demo, democracy. But I don't think he's alone. I think Mr. Trump might have something in common there. Um, the Tarthin, as I said, has, has now been uh, preserved for 60 years, uh, if not longer, and it really is a, a fantastic railway. If you find yourself in Wales, I, I implore you to go and see it, not only because of its ability to be preserved in aspic as, as an old railway, but also because it which enables us to do all sorts of things like bring two-foot gauge steam engines because the Tarthin is a two-foot, three-inch gauge railway, and build special track for them to run and all sorts of things. And whilst I was enjoying it there, the problem I had is that I'd been the volunteer there. I'd been a volunteer there since 1981. I'm now a locomotive driver there. I also served on their council for a period of time and, and I enjoyed it. But the problem I had is everybody knew me. And anybody who's been in management will understand that actually that makes it quite hard if everybody sees you as their friend, it is very difficult to actually manage them strategically. And you will always have that baggage of being good old Chris Price. So whilst I was able to make my mark, and I felt I made my, made my mark there, we certainly, we came into the digital age. We saw Facebook, social media, and things like that coming to the fore. And we were able to develop the digital marketing aspect of the railway. And it became far more visible as an organization it has been left to others to build on that success. And I'm pleased to say that the Taufin finds itself in a very good place. It's a railway that, like the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, has weathered the storm of COVID-19 very, very well. There are others, I fear, that may not be weathering that storm so well, uh, but more about that later. Finally, and probably what a lot of people, I saw a few backgrounds when I started, um, the, I saw a few backgrounds pop up when you, uh, when everybody was invited into the meeting, and I saw one of them of Pickering Station, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be talking to the people who know more about the railway than I do. So, first of all, I must apologise if anything I say is inaccurate. Please feel free to drop it in the chat. Uh, people are quite right where the Tarpin Railway is. It is indeed near Tawin. It's about 30 miles north of Aberystwyth, and the Ballard Lake Railway is indeed a different railway. It, uh, Whilst the South End Railway is named after a lake, it doesn't go round one, unlike the Bala. Um, it's quite interesting that that came from Sexy Steve, which I'm quite impressed with that name. You must have some serious self-confidence there, chap. Right, um, North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Um, like I said, very honoured to see their job come advertised and apply. Uh, and it was a, a short list of um, 
26 people, which I've, I've never come across that in a job interview, being shortlisted to 26 people. But from that, I was very lucky enough to become the one that got chosen to be the general manager. It's been an absolute honour. I found a railway that, whilst it was undoubtedly one of the busiest in, busiest in Europe, perhaps wasn't as comfortable with itself as it could have been. Um, the, the morale levels were not great. Uh, it had a reputation for being a railway which predominantly uh, was, was diesel hauled with the occasional steam engine. And it was my job to try and turn the North Yorkshire Moors Railway into being a railway that was proud of itself again. Others will judge of whether we've been successful on that, but it has involved, also, uh, as, as I said about a town thing, it's involved, evolved very much about increasing the prominence of the railway, making sure people are aware of it. And one of the initiatives that brought us into the spotlight was the Channel 5 programme. The Channel 5 programme I'll again talk about later, but it, it's been interesting. It's been an interesting journey. But I mean, one of the asides I will give you is that uh, we had a young lady who should remain nameless who worked on the staff who came running into my office and, and couldn't understand why we were making a documentary about flies. It was only after she talked to me for about 10 minutes, I realized that she'd over-translated the fly on the wall documentary. So, but anyway, that was a great success. We enjoyed that. And I will talk about that later. But what I thought I'd do is show you a couple of photographs. This is where the railway came from. This is pre-1965, classic LNER locomotive on the front of some uh, pre, um, pre um, I think they're, so, some mixture, uh, a mixture of the nationalisation and pre-nationalised stock on a double track railway going through a beautiful area of the North Yorkshire Moors countryside. This particular area is Newtondale. We go, go back to the today and where we are. We are a railway which runs many different types of locomotives, not predominantly northeastern railway locomotives, although the railway is built based in the northeast, we're, we're not lucky enough. There's only 28 northeastern, London Northeastern Railway locomotives in preservation. So the chances of us being able to create the, the railway before nationalisation is very small, but we do our best. However, this is a classic example of, um, of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway today, which is an LMS locomotive pulling LNER coaches, which to the purists would make people jump up and down but I'm afraid it is the reality of railway preservation nowadays is that the vast majority of people that come to see a heritage railway come to see a railway because they want to see a steam engine. And it is terrible for the purists to realize that the vast majority of those people don't actually know what steam engine they're looking at. But of course, they're not the vocal ones. The vocal ones to me as the general manager are all the ones that are telling me that this wasn't accurate and that wasn't accurate and that wouldn't have been the engine that ran in that day. I just have to live with that, I'm afraid. That's just part of the job and I cope with it. But fundamentally, we deliver as a heritage railway. We carry about 300,000 passengers a year and nearly all of them go away happy. A few more photographs. This is what, to me, it's really all about. As a 15-year-old who started in railway preservation in the early 80s. I am proud of the fact that we currently have 60 people on our young junior volunteer scheme. They are a mixture of people between the, working on our North, we're working with the Northeastern Locomotive Preservation Group and ourselves. There is all sorts of problems associated with bringing children onto the railway, not, not least of the fact that very recently uh, we were informed that actually anybody under the age of 16 it is illegal for them to work because some obscure law that was brought out after the First World War to stop the railways using children as slave labour. However, we have risk assessed that and we believe the value to our industry of associating the young into it at an early age is worth the risk of being, being tried by the, by the law. Fortunately, that law has never been tested, so we're fairly confident that's not going to happen. But no, these are the lifeblood. They are the future. I am very proud of the fact that uh, a large chunk of the full-time staff at our Gromont workshops have all been recruited from this um, 
this group, this effectively this junior volunteers group. Right, I've got, we've just been asked, I suppose, as an aside, why did you join the North Yorkshire Moors Rally? That was from Stanley uh, Goulding. And I have to be honest with you, Stanley, uh, the main reason being is I wanted to pay the mortgage. I wasn't being paid enough to pay the mortgage where I lived, and I wanted to pay. A, I wanted a bigger house, so I, I took the promotion. But also, if I'm absolutely honest with you, I was incredibly uh, honoured to be able to take that job. It was always seen as the pinnacle of the heritage railway sector. I got my enjoyment in heritage railways not from just volunteering on them, but I found the governance of heritage railways fascinating what better opportunity than to take on the governance of one of the biggest heritage railways and also one of the more prominent. And I'm very, very pleased um, that actually what's, what's come out of that is, is that I've learned an awful lot. I've learned an awful lot from the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway has improved me and it's enabled me to go on and help manage the, uh, or help in the management of Heritage Railways Association. Oh, Stanley, don't be, don't be sorry you asked. <laughs> I hope the second half of the answer satisfies you. Um, Chris, outside the NYMR, what is your favourite engine and why? Well, this, this is going to, I'm afraid, disappoint some people because it's not going to be Mallard or Flying Scotsman or Stevenson's Rocket or Thomas the Tank Engine. I'm afraid my favourite locomotive is a lowly narrow gauge locomotive, and, and that is uh, number four, which is a Kerr Stewart built locomotive in Stoke on Trent. Uh, number four, Edward Thomas on the South End Railway. My happiest time is on that locomotive. I get a lot of enjoyment from seeing the big locomotives and the big engines, but really, I think I have to go back to the, my roots and say my favourite engine is on the South End Railway in Wales. Um, right, we'll move on. Just another final picture, and this was probably the most recent photograph that, that I've seen taken of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway a 9F freight locomotive pulling uh, standard British Railways Mark I coaches. Uh, coming out of Leversham Station on one of our Santa specials uh, last Christmas. The reason I put this on is, A, I think it's a lovely photograph, but also it, it represents that there is hope for us because we are finding 2020 quite depressing. It's been quite a difficult year. I'll talk about it later, but we've all found 2020 a difficult year. But this to me was the highlight of the year when it, just before Christmas, we were able to actually still run trains and still enjoy them for what they were. Uh, I've been asked by Brian, how many staff work on the railway? We're quite fortunate is that we have 114 paid staff on the railway. Um, that also comes with it great responsibility. 114 staff mean 114 families across North Yorkshire are fed because of the success and failure of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. As you can appreciate, in 2020, when I stood in front of them and told a large chunk of them they were furloughed, and at that time, I didn't know financially how we were going to continue paying them because the furlough scheme had only been announced for one month. Uh, you can realize that it does come with a burden, but also it's a great opportunity. Without those staff working alongside our volunteers, which is a completely symbiotic relationship, we would not be the railway we are today. And sorry, it wasn't quite the final photograph. I forgot my own presentation. I think this is uh, gives you an idea about how busy the North Yorkshire Moors Railway can come, especially when Flying Scotsman comes riding into town. It really is like having the Manchester United of steam engines turn up. Um, and that's exactly what it was. We were very lucky enough after the recent rebuild of Flying Scotsman to be the first heritage railway uh, to host the locomotive and I've never seen it was the, the locomotive was the least of our problems controlling the crowds was something I've never experienced at one, one day we estimated 30,000 people came out to see the locomotive it truly is a phenomenon and when we talk about you know the the problems with you know burning coal for heritage railways one of the things that I always say to people is can you imagine the headline in the times or the guardian or or one of the big broadsheets that says flying Scotsman will never steam again. Well, certainly that's not a concept that I've been able to live with throughout my lifetime. And I, and I hope for the remainder of my lifetime, it's not something I see. Current and future challenges. I'll, I'll talk about the current and future challenges of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. 
Um, but I'll also talk, if I may, about the current and future challenges to the heritage railway movement. The effects in 2020 and the future. There is no two ways about it that the heritage railway sector is predominantly a charitable sector. It's run on a non-for-profit basis. There isn't, I can't think of any railways out there. They're a bit like football teams. If you want to get, if you want to make a small fortune, start with a big one and own a heritage railway. Um, and as such, the, the, it was a very tight year for heritage railways. We were very, very lucky. There's been a lot of criticism of government. But on the whole, I would say that the opportunities for heritage railways in 2020 with grant funding through the uh, Arts Council grant and the National Lottery has enabled the survival of heritage railways. As I said, I was very, very worried at one point, certainly March last year, that the North Yorkshire Moors Railway wouldn't survive. I do think it's going to force heritage railways to consider different futures. Um, I think they're going to have to think far more about fundraising, far more about the benefit, not just to railway enthusiasts and ourselves, but also the benefit to the wider, to the wider world, making sure that we also are beneficial to the community, making sure that we are responsible as, you know, for our uh, carbon emissions, making sure that we are attractive to investment, attractive to funders, because I fear without them, we are now left in a rather scarred situation where if people don't come back to visitors, there is a very real res risk that several heritage railways in Great Britain will fail. I don't believe they're gonna fail imminently, but I think the challenge of the winter of 21, 22 will really be sorting out the men from the boys. And I have to be honest with you, sitting in front of you, I, we are not out the woods. It's not all roses. I am actually quite worried about it. Um, before that, we have seen a worrying downturn in trend in tourism. Um, as I said in brackets, it's maybe offset in the short term. I think it will be, I think the staycation is going to become something that we're far more familiar with now. I think we're going to see far more people stay in the UK. At the moment, it's technically very difficult to leave the UK. So I think if we are able to run trains again um, around April, May time, then I think that the consumer confidence will come back. But one of the questions then has to be, how much have we damaged our economy? How much is tourism going to be effective? How, much, how many pounds are people going to be left with in their pocket? So again, this is something that we've got to be gazing at the horizon with. If we don't, we could be in trouble again. Up to then, we've held our own with income growth, but we've, we've held our own with income growth by raising fares. Um, there is no two ways about it. We've become more and more of a luxury item as we've gone on. It's not been something that you can just nip down your local heritage railway. It's now £40 to buy a ticket on the North Yorkshire Malls Railway. So it's not something you're going to do on a whim, especially if you're a family of four. So I would like to see a situation, hopefully, where if we become more successfully, as successful as a charitable organisation and heritage railways as a whole become more charitable in their focus, that they will enable them to open themselves up a bit more to those people who may not have the brass in their pocket than, than, than before. As I said, financially, cash flow is a challenge. That's been brought into highlight this year with COVID-19. And legislation. We're seeing in the early days of railway preservation in 1950, it was very much, let's give it a go. Risk assessment, method statements, these weren't phrases that dropped into the vocabulary of the people of the 50s, 60s, 70s, or really, uh, even 80s. These weren't, this wasn't language in, uh, that appeared until the 90s. And of course, we've become ever more risk averse as a society. Some would argue quite rightly, it is interesting to note, I think that four years ago was the first year since 1889 that nobody had been killed accidentally on a railway in Britain. So you can say that we can say that, that safety is improving and it is saving lives. However, it brings a new challenge to heritage railways. We're now in a situation where we are dealing with the, the challenges of actually having to fit modern central door locking to our coaches. Mind you, that's quite a good thing now because the modern generations are not aware of, the, of hinges on uh, doors on trains with hinges. And we do have we have had one or two complaints over the last couple of years where 
people have waited for the train to arrive. It's arrived and left and the door hasn't opened for them and they've been very confused and they've missed their train. So on that basis, it's probably not a bad thing now that we have central door locking for people who don't understand the basics of a door. Um, drop lights, they're now looking at, because of the accident on the Gatwick Express where a guy put his head out the window and that didn't end well for him. But actually they're now looking at restricting the drop lights on heritage windows. Um, this will be a shame because one of the joys of traveling on a steam train is sticking your head out the window and listening to the noise and smelling the coal. Um, we are fighting that legislation. We are trying to make it more pragmatic, but it is still there for us and it's something we have to consider. Um, we have seen capital investment in heritage railways predominantly down. Uh, the main reason being is because we're undergoing large projects. We're finding the infrastructure on heritage railways are now getting old. Uh, the North Yorkshire Malls railways bridges were all second hand in 1909. They came off the East Coast Main Line and they're all wearing out. So what we're finding, although we're having to now fund major projects, we've been very lucky with the National Lottery Heritage Fund in that we've, we've, we've as you will see in a couple of videos, I'll show you later, we've been able to invest in our infrastructure. But this is main that the routine maintenance, the routine investment has had to drop, which has made the cash flow challenges of heritage railways far more lumpy and less predictable, which again adds to the, adds to the challenge. We're seeing a change in demograph of volunteers. We're seeing a situation where our volunteer, our average age of volunteers on the North Yorkshire Malls Railway is now 67. That, as you can possibly realize from that number, is not sustainable. So it's why we're seeing a creep towards um, big, more and more staff on heritage railways, which increases costs. Um, are you planning any special events for this year? Use the NYMR for a pub crawl, it works. Well, I'd like to think we're more than a pub crawl, but well done for that one. I suppose it's one of the options you can do. Are you planning any special events this year? We are, at the moment, it's very difficult. Um, we used to run up to six special events, including War Weekend, which is a big time commitment. But this moment in time, the only special event we're focusing on is the gala. The gala in September, where we get visiting locomotives in. We're hoping to make sure that we get, it's a good gala this year, so watch, um, so watch the press. We'll do our best. But as I say, going back to volunteer time commitment, it's now becoming a bigger of a problem with, with demographs. Um, but we are, and, and so we're always having to look at different alternatives. One of the things we've just done on North Yorkshire Moors Railway as part of the National Lottery Heritage Fund project is we've now for the first time appointed a volunteer development officer whose job it is, is to look for more avenues, look to society and say, you don't have to be a railway enthusiast. Or you don't have to want to work on a steam engine. You can come and work and you can give things back to society by doing so. Big one, carbon sequestration. I think that's how I said it. I'm not quite sure if that's correct or not. Basically, carbon offsetting. We burn coal. There is no two ways about it. The heritage railway industry, in fact, the heritage industry in the UK, burns 40,000 tonnes of coal a year. Uh, and that's got to be really, if we're going to fight for the opportunity to continue to burn that coal, we have to be seen as an industry to be responsible. So we are going to have to look at initiatives like carbon offsetting. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway is currently working with the Northern Forest Initiative, we're trying to make sure that we can get trees planted in our name. And our plan is as a railway is to be carbon neutral within 10 years. So we are doing our best. We have got, if we're going to make the argument to continue to burn coal, we have got to be seen to be doing it responsibly. We cannot use the argument that we only burn a small amount and the UK still burns millions of tons of coal a year because eventually we will be the only people in the UK burning coal. It will come eventually. So we have to make the educational argument. But if you don't allow somebody to continue to burn coal at a small level with minimum damage to the environment because we are carbon offsetting, then you will lose the opportunity of educating the children about the great British heritage of the Industrial Revolution in this country. So we are now arguing that there is an educational and a society benefit to burn a limited amount of coal on heritage railways. Could we burn renewable wood? The big problem with renewable wood and alternatives is basically the fact that you need an awful lot more wood to burn than you do coal. 
So therefore, your locomotives that are designed to hold a small amount of coal that will get you anywhere you want to go, all of a sudden now don't hold enough if you want to fill it with wood. So renewable wood is also a challenge from the point of view it's not as heavy as coal. Steam locomotives require blast to enable them to steam. And as coal is lighter than coal, as wood is lighter than coal, you end up blowing most of the wood up the chimney and setting fire to most of the countryside. So you end up with big balloons on top of your chimney, as you saw in America, as spark arresters and all sorts of things. So it becomes a major problem, as you, somebody said, the calorific value in coal is so much greater. Um, we are, look, gas, again, the same problem. Regardless of what you come up with as a fuel to power a locomotive, you're still burning carbon. You still have to be responsible when you burn it. Doesn't matter if it's coal, wood, or oil, you're still burning carbon, you're still putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So you have to be aware of that. There is work going on in America at the moment with torrified biomass, which is trying to create something close using renewable wood to coal. Uh, that's in the early stages, but we're keeping an eye on it. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway is also in early talks with Manchester Metropolitan University to work with them to look for green alternatives to coal and to see if a product can be developed for that. So we're working on it, but predominantly, I still think the short term to medium term is that we've got to find a way of burning a small amount of coal and doing it as responsibly as possible. We're also introducing gift aid this year. So if you do come along to the North Yorkshire Moors Rally, please fill out your gift aid declaration and give us another 25%. Not that we're greedy, we just want to keep doing it. So there we go, that's my advert, that's my plug. Uh, I want to quickly talk about, I'm getting close to time now, but I want to quickly talk about um, the Channel 5 programme. As people are aware, they may have seen me and myself and, and of course, the famous Piglet. Um, I'll answer Kevin Stewart's question in a minute about Harry Potter movies, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the four episodes have now been done on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Sorry, four series. Uh, we are in early talks about doing a fifth. It's been fantastic at bringing the railway into the public eye. Uh, when it was first mooted by Channel 5, it was suggested we may get 400,000 viewers a, year, a week. Uh, we averaged 1.2 million every week. So it does give you an indication that railways are still at the heart of people in Britain. We, they still love railways. We're still fundamentally a, rail, a, a nation of railway lovers. And it's been great to see the success of that. The purists have their toes curled up in their shoes with the lack of continuity and everything else. But to a certain extent, I would argue you're missing the point if you're going to get cross about the continuity. What this is about is it's about showing the public and friendly face of Heritage Railways. It's not all about the steam engines. It's also about the people behind them and the people that make them run. And if I'm absolutely honest with you, that's what is important to me. Heritage railways are a means of bringing people together, be that passengers, be that families, or be that volunteers or members. And that's fundamentally why I'm pleased that the Channel 5 programme portrays the people more than it portrays the, the locomotives. The purists, as I say, probably were sticking pin. If there's any of you out there that are sticking pins in my effigy of what I've just said, I apologise, but I can assure you, the benefit of that has been dramatic. It's one of the reasons we have prospered through 2020 when it could have been so easy to go to the wall. Where are we going and what's the future? As we said, we're currently investing 10 million pounds over the next five years, uh, although that's down to about three or four years now. Um, that predominantly is bridges. It's probably a brand new carriage shed which holds 40 carriages. If anybody who stood next to a steam engine realised that 40 carriages under one roof uh, would be absolutely spectacular, and it is a big building. How much work have you managed to undertake during lockdown? ORR, safety critical work. Um, Peter Robinson, thanks for that question. I can tell you that we have kept up to date with all our safety critical work during lockdown. Uh, we've worked very closely with the ORR. And we've also managed competence and made damn sure that all our locomotive crews are fully competent before we open again. Even those who don't love steam love heritage railways. I know because my wife loves them. Well, that's the winner, isn't it? That's the killer one, isn't it? Thank you very much for that. Sexy Steve again. I do worry about your handle, but thanks very much for that. But no, you're absolutely right. It is, it is a general love of steam and it is nice to see kids and wives enjoying it, not just 
us anoraks stood at the end with our anoraks and notebooks. Um, but I'm going to talk about this in a minute. I should change my name. Yes, you should, Steve. It's awful. Sexy Steve. You've got to be sexy, Steve. That's all I'll say to you. Um, what sort of costs are involved with keeping one locomotive going? How many locomotives? The North Yorkshire Moles Railway has 14 locomotives on its books. We have 10 operable. I would say that the uh, over a 10-year period, which is the cycle of a boiler management process, over that period, you could be spending anything between 150 and a quarter of a million pounds on that locomotive on maintenance. And if that comes for a point in which it needs serious work, uh, you could be talking close to seven figures on occasion. So we are roughly spending about seven to 800,000 pounds on our railway every year, um, just, just to keep it going, just to keep the locomotives going. And we run at a loss. If the truth be known, we, we need half a million more from charitable charitable functions such as fundraising than we actually raise in fares. So when somebody screams at me that our fares are expensive, I do want to tell them, excuse me, sir, you, you do realise that your fare has merely made a contribution towards running the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. You haven't actually paid for it. I'm not sure that's something that people grasp when they go on the average heritage railway, be that the Swanage, the Bluebell, be that the East Lanks Railway, the Tower Thin Railway. Or, or the uh, North Norfolk Railway, or the Strathspey, Strathspey Railway in Scotland. They're not running at a profit. They are running on a not-for-profit making basis, and they're not just running trains to make that money. Uh, bonus and Canal Railway, yes. Uh, it's uh, up there near, near Kilmarnock, if I remember rightly. Yes, it's uh, a fantastic railway up there. They've currently got one of our old engines, the K1 locomotive that used to run there, which is now up there on the static display. Carriage of development, I'll talk about that. I'm going to show you a couple of videos and now I'm going to go into the questions. Um, one of the things I talked about with legislation, those of you who will remember traveling on um, coaches up to the mid 70s, even early 80s, will remember that uh, there was the sign saying, please do not pull the chain whilst in the station because your, because your, um, your deposits found their way onto the track. And in the station, that didn't look great. Uh, we have the same problem uh, on the uh, North Yorkshire Moors Railway, but we're one of the few heritage railways in Britain that also runs onto the network. Um, and as such, we have to deal with modern legislation. And uh, the, uh, the, the track workers of, the, of the, the national network have declared that it's not attractive to work um, in excrement and toilet paper. So we have had to fit controlled emission toilets. And this has been a sponsored project by Network Rail which has been going on this winter, which has been uh, another three quarters of a million pounds into us as a railway. So that's been great. Do you have sponsorship? Well, limited, yes, but it's usually on low level. What we don't have is uh, corporate sponsorship. You won't find the name of a, uh, we, we've got to maintain the fact that we are a heritage railway. So we're not going to spot Microsoft down one of our coaches on the hope that it gets us a few quid. So, uh, so I'm afraid we do have corporate response, uh, sponsorship and some of the notice boards were, 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 were put up by the LNER, but not the LNER from Virgin East West Coast, I can assure you. Uh, locomotive, we've just talked about that. Uh, is there a locomotive you would like to see run on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway? Good question. Yes, easy one. V2, Green Arrow, out of the National Rail Museum, should be running up and down the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Shouldn't be stuck in a museum. It's got me into trouble, I'm sure. Um, moving track, we've got to now go away from replacing it wholesale towards maintaining it more. And we've got to, as I said earlier, look far more on volunteer initiatives. I'm now going to show you a couple of videos. They're just quick ones, two minutes each, just plus, just to show you some of the activities we've been up to. This is one of them was the bridge replacement of Bridge 27, and one of them was the build. One of them is the building of a carriage shed, which is actually close to completion, but the the video was was uh, done uh, before that. How about the P2 when it's ready? The P2 is a locomotive for those of you who don't know that's being built in Darlington by the A1 Trust, the people who bought your tornado. Um, that I can give I can give you a bit of an exclusive. The plate, the railway it's going to be tested on when it's complete is the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. So I will see the P2 run on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. More big locomotive events. I think that's, a, people like to see big, powerful locomotives working and I think we're going to be doing more of those. So I'll just play you this video if I may, if it'll play. Oh no, I'm going too far. There we go.
I hope everybody can hear that. Drop me a message if you can't. on to the next one and play that one and it's then I'll go over to questions so I'm glad somebody enjoyed the schools class I noticed somebody asked me um um what the a, a big boy would a big boy specific uh, Pacific ever come to the UK there's a big problem with that is they're about twice the size of a UK engine so they don't fit down the tunnels I'm afraid but nice idea uh, schools class yes a beautiful locomotive great right. is the speed limit too low on heritage railways uh Steam engines are stunning when running fast. They are. They are indeed. But also, the heritage railways, if I ran my railway at full 50 miles an hour, my trip would be about half the length it is now. And I'm not sure people would pay £40 for a shorter journey. Also, you have to remember, we are managing risk. We're dealing with volunteers. I think if, you are, if you're running a professional railway with purely full-time staff, with a limited number of staff, where it's easy to maintain competencies, then yes, you can run a faster railway. But I'm afraid, uh, I think 25 mile an hour. I would say that the North Yorkshire Moors Railway makes up for its lack of speed in the fact that the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, it's 18 miles, had a speed limit of 35 miles an hour in pre-preservation days. So we're not running miles away from the speed that we were running. We're also running coach trains that are three times, three coaches longer than the normal train in pre-preservation days. So our locomotives are working considerably harder. So I would argue if you came to the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, you'll see engines working harder than they did pre-preservation. And you'll also see engines working not dissimilar to the speeds they would have run on the same line. I hope that helped. Yep, the um, Shakespeare Express can go 75 mile an hour. It doesn't very often go 75 mile an hour. Most of the locomotives pulling it limited to 60. But yes, it does. It's great. It's fantastic. But there's a place for mainline steam. There's also a place for uh, heritage railways. I'll just play one final video and then we'll go to questions. This is predominantly what we did recently in building a bridge. And it's just a, fan, just a fantastic time lapse. So you'll bear with me. The music starts in a minute.
Thank you. Um, that's um, predominantly the end of my presentation. I will go now into um, questions. Um, let me just get that one up for you. Final screen. Put a dramatic one on them. There we go. There we go. Questions. Um, there's two questions come up. Will it be possible to link through to Beamish in the future? Um, it's a bit too far away, I'm afraid. I'd love to, but it's a very long way away from the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. I think that would be a challenge too far. Um, somebody asked whether we could use the coal from Whitehaven. Um, the coal from Whitehaven, I'm not sure. Mr Johnson has actually given it permission to go ahead. But if he had, unfortunately, the, um, the coal from Whitehaven is coking coal predominantly for use in the steel making industry. So it's not coal, unfortunately, suitable for heritage railways. Coal for heritage railways in the future, I'm afraid, will be coming purely from Russia. I can't see us ever going back to a situation where we were burning British coal again, unless something miracle happens. The environmental lobby seems to have uh, weaved their magic on that, and I cannot see uh, coals yeah. for normal burning use being made. Yeah. The question to I'm just telling. Okay. Um, mm. Is the tower fin the only non-standard gauge rich narrow gauge in the UK? Um, the standard narrow gauge is two foot. The tower fin is two foot three. The Welsh form of Anvar is also is two foot six. So the tower fin is not unique. It is the unique in the fact that it and the Corris are the only two foot three inch gauge railways. How many bridges do you have? Sorry, I'm nicking Kelly's job here. It's, it's all coming in now. I'm going to leave this one to Kelly now before I get out of hand. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll carry on with that one then, Chris. How many bridges do you have on the line and how many have you now replaced as per the video? Um, we've, we've replaced, funny enough, we've replaced about only three. We have 41 bridges on the railway. Predominantly, we're, we're very lucky in the fact that North Yorkshire Moors Railway has very limited over bridges. We don't have many. We have a tunnel and a couple of others, but predominantly uh, we're, we're a railway of under bridges, um, but we've got a lot of them. And they're all built, as I say, either, either in 1830. Uh, 1865 or they were replaced at the turn of the last century so we have got a challenge and it is a worry but we're on it we're getting on with it um but it is something you have to do yeah earlier on there's a couple of questions um did the tv series heartbeat have a big impact on the on the railway i, know yeah, I also saw a reference to harry potter as well on that um yes it did it still does um aiden's field still very much figures in in the tourist's mind when people get off at Gotham Station, they walk up to sort of Gotham Arms Hotel, which has even capitalised on it and made sure it still remains the, uh, the Aidens Field Arms. Scripps Garage is now very much a gift shop. Uh, there's no two ways about it. Heartbeat. I'd like to point out it's still primetime TV in Denmark. So there you go. Um, Harry Potter, again, that worked for us. Uh, we're, we're on the first our Harry Potter movie. And also Hogsmeade Station was, in fact, Gotham Station on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. So Hagrid stood ringing his bell on the bottom of our station puts in. Um, one quick question has just popped up about the uh, new carriage shed being built. Where is that actually I say just, just north of Pickering, uh, on a place called, place called Trout Farm. Uh, £3.2 million project. Uh, involving all sorts of things, including the ability to preheat coaches with steam heating so that people don't get into cold coaches in the morning. Awful lot of work going into that. Uh, as I said, hopefully this will be finished by, uh, hopefully it'll be finished sometime this month. And do you own all the trains which are on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway or do you rent them in from private uh, individuals? It's a mixture. Locomotives, we own a small amount of locomotives, but we also hire them in. Predominantly, we hire them from not so much individuals, but from owning groups. Uh, so you find that most heritage, most heritage locomotives are now owned. There are a few locomotives in private ownership, but predominantly most locomotives are now owned by charitable trusts, simply because you need that fundraising aspect of your job. There's, there's the, to own a steam locomotive, is you're a custodian of it. It's not something you're, going to make a, you're ever going to make money out of it. So... It's a mixture between locomotives we hire in and locomotives we own. Have you ever been on the Pasty Express? The no. Bodmin and Wenford Railway? No, I have been on the Bodmin and Wenford Railway, but I have not. I, I even know their chairman personally, but I am afraid I have not been on the Pasty Express. But I do like Cornish pasties, if that helps. Um, just, just to comment, my uh, uh, wife's two uncles 
uh, uh, great uncles worked on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway uh, about 80 years engine ago where, but as engine drivers. Brilliant. They brought me to London. Yeah, I mean, that was when the line was through to York. Yes, well, the, you have to remember the history of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, of course, is that it was open to connect the line of, between Whitby and Pickering originally. And it was open predominantly because Whitby was deteriorating as a town. The whale industry had died out and the fishing industry wasn't able to get its fish to market quick enough. So the, the, the wealthy uh, business owners of Whitby clubbed together and paid Mr. Stevenson the, uh, the, the exorbitant sum to build the North Chamorros Railway or the Whitby or Pickering Railway as it was then. And it was a great success because it cut the travelling time from Whitby to York from 24 hours to eight. There you go. You can now do it in about one hour 30 in a car. About, no, it's probably about one hour 20 in a car. Okay. And what year would that be? What year would it be that we... Uh, the railway was opened in 1835. It became steam hauled in 1865 and it closed to public passengers in 1965. And then reopened as a preservation site in 67. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. No problem. Do you still have the Sir Nigel at uh, North Sir Nigel Gresley locomotive. No, it's still synonymous, but it's currently in York Railway Museum being rebuilt at the moment. But there is plans for it to visit the railway back when, it, when the rebuild's finished. But currently, if you want to go and see it, go to York Railway Museum and you can see it in bits. Right, I'm just scrolling through the list here, Chris. There's several coming in, trying to keep up with them as uh, as hard work. Um, well, the one I would, look, there's one I'd like to answer if it's all right, Kelly. Yeah. And that's can wheelchair access trains on the all stations? Um, at the moment, you can access trains, but by prior arrangement, and it will, and it's not the great. If I'm honest with you, if I was a wheelchair user. Uh, I'd be encouraged by what I'm about to say is the fact that we are currently just about to take delivery of four specially converted fuss-free access coaches, specially for less able people to use, which will have bigger, deeper picture windows and the ability for wheelchairs to get on and off. So we want to make sure that the experience, although it's a 1950s experience, is as good for those less able-bodied people as it is for, for everybody else. So we are doing things this year to make sure that's better. But yes, I'd still advise people to check on our website before they came. Chris has asked, he, he says he's noticed that on a new carriage shed, there's a canopy out towards the uh, running track. Are you planning a new hole so people can get out and have a look at the works? No, that's not the plan. The main reason being is that that canopy over the running, it's not quite over the running track, it's actually over a siding next to it, which used to be called long siding. Uh, we're going to be parking our uh, Pullman dining train there, and that's actually the servicing facility so, because our ambition is to not is to run dining trains from the Pickering end of the railway and not the Gromont end of the railway. Sorry if these are a bit nuanced, not general. No. How does your railway compare in size of the Sun Valley Railway? Can I nick that one off you, Kelly? Yeah, I was then going to ask that one. You got there first. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, the uh, the uh, the 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 Sun Valley Railway is effectively uh, very much the equivalent of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway in the Midlands. Uh, there's similar length, similar amount of staff, similar turnover, very similar organisations. Uh, and Helen Smith, I know personally, and her number's on my mobile. So we do compare notes a lot. So I think comparable with the Seven Valley Railway would be my description. One I question, I, one I'll ask from myself is, you said you've got 114 people on the payroll, I believe. How many volunteers do you actually have then? Uh, we've, got, we've got about 1,000 volunteers on our, pay, on our payroll. So... 10% of our working staff, roughly 10, 11% of our staff are permanent. The rest of them are made up of volunteers. I do say this very often. Fortunately, all the thousand don't come at once. They do spread it over the year, which makes life much easier. Um, we have uh, getting in the region of 340 footplate crew to give you some idea of, kind of how many people are involved in running the railway. It's quite spectacular. And I, cause I, I'm, I'm down here in North Norfolk, so we've got the North Norfolk Railway on my doorstep. So we go down there on quite a regular basis. And the, uh, the biggest event they have down here is the, um, the forties weekend. I know you run something similar at, uh, yeah. up, up your place. What sort of numbers do you get to come out for that then? We estimate 50,000 people visit the railway over the weekend of war weekend in October. 
Uh, it's huge. It's one of the biggest events we do. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's also one of the most complicated events to put on and requires the most staff input. And unfortunately, it was a victim last year. And I think because everybody is still trapped at home, is they may well be the victim of this year as well, which is very sad. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, we do do it. It's very, very popular. Uh, I know they're North Norfolk Railway very, very well. We're currently involved in a joint project with them. We actually, funny enough, um, because the North Yorkshire Moors Railway is one of the only heritage railways to run the national network, when the North Norfolk Railway goes to Cromer, they're actually driven by people passed out under the competencies of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. So the North Yorkshire Moors Railway runs trains from Sheringham to Cromer, as, running, as well as running trains from Pickering to Whitby. There's a little known fact, Kelly. I really didn't, well, didn't know that one. No, I didn't know that one. <laughs> um, Mike has said that he volunteers for the Mid Hence Watercrest Line. They ran a special uh, steam illuminations um, like uh, train at Christmas, which are very popular. How many of the uh, heritage railways do that now? I, I know North Norfolk do it as well. Yeah, we, we did. We did last year. Um, there were about three or four last year. I think that's gone up to about five or six this year. Uh, it is a growing event. It goes hand in hand with Christmas and works very, very well. Uh, anybody who has seen the Channel 5 programme over Christmas, the Christmas special would have seen the trials and tribulations of stress that I suffered whilst putting on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway illuminated trains. But no, they're a great success. They work. It's another, it's another string to the Bow Heritage Railway. I do apologise if I've upset anybody that wants to be described as differently abled or I'm, I'm unaware, but I, I stumble through life and I apologise if I've upset you. I'm afraid I, I was merely trying to point out that we have great advantages for, for people in wheelchairs to come to the railway. So I'm sorry if I use incorrect terminology. All right, I'm just scrolling back up the list. If anybody has got anything else, then please send it in on the message line. No, it's gone very quiet, Chris. Oh, that's good. Perhaps I've, perhaps I've bored them all today. Has anybody left out there watching? That's the question. <laughs> There's still several out there watching, yes. <laughs> hey, Chris, what's your biggest revenue event? What revenue do we take? What kind of what kind of that means of, 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 of a year? What revenue would become on special events? Yeah. Uh, I'd be guessing, but I would say probably in the region of £300,000 a year through special events. And our turnover is just shy of seven million. And which which is the best special event that you put on? Um, the the most profitable is yes. always the annual steam gala. The biggest is always the war weekend, and the one that attracts the most people is always the war weekend. But the war weekend unfortunately comes with more costs than anything else does because you're hiring reenactors, you're bringing in events and hiring marquees and. The list goes on. We have road closures and the costs for that event go quite north very rapidly. But the most successfully, most successful financially is very much our annual gala event where we bring in the guest locomotive. And Don says, and what sort of money do you expect to make from the Mission Impossible? Ah, do you think I could possibly tell you? <laughs> I think Mr. Cruz would have me, might have my guts for garters if I told you. It, it's it, it's lucrative, I'll say that. Would you like to expand on what you were telling us uh, when you first joined us this evening about the uh, today's call and what happened? Oh yes, uh, I found myself very strangely. Uh, uh, well, on this twenty seventh of this month, I find my well, I know, but I've got to be quiet. I'm not allowed to say a lot of this stuff, so you may be putting me on the spot here, Kelly. But let's just say we've interacted with Tom. That's all I'll say at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that then. Yes, that's fine. Well, it looks as if the questions have dried up. So I think we'll uh, hand over for the uh, thanks then, please, uh, Mark. Very good. Peter, would you like to introduce uh, yeah. Hugh? It's uh, Hugh, yeah. Uh, Thanks very much, uh, Chris. F fascinating talk. Very interesting. I was absolutely delighted when you said your favourite locomotive was made in, made in Stoke-on-Trent by the company that my great-grandfather was managing director of. So that was <laughs> great to hear. Uh, I would like to hand over now to my good friend Hugh, 
who is a, a big train buff. Um, when, it, when we're out on 41, I have a job keeping him on track. But uh, oh. I'll hand over to you now. We will give the vote of thanks, please. Thanks, Peter. Uh, many thanks, Chris, for giving us a fascinating insight into the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, especially at this difficult time for all heritage and tourist venues. Not just the pandemic, but as you said, the future search for proper steam coal. Now, as a volunteer on the Great Central here in Leicestershire, I can relate to some of what you talked about, but I am sure I speak for all of us on the hard work you and your team are doing to keep the railway running. And we do hope to see you, Piglet, and all the gang back on television shortly. Here at 41 Club, we've just launched a new railway special interest group on Facebook. And as soon as we all get out of the current pandemic and restrictions ease, I'm sure there will be lots of photos posted from the moors and your railway. I, for one, will be making a special journey to ride in the beaver tail after its restoration and first outing on the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Many thanks, Chris, once again, and can I ask members to show their appreciation in the usual way. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll give, a big clap. Thank you. give an even bigger clap at the end. Right, now just Fantastic. Two. Fantastic. Uh, Steve, Fantastic. And then we'll... Uh, Steve, do you want to introduce the next, the upcoming events? Yeah, thanks, Mark. And thanks, Chris. And um, folks, those of you who watch rugby, you will know there's a very big game coming up a week Saturday when the old enemy comes to the Principality um, and play Wales. Um, to kickstart the Six Nations weekend, we have the international um, world rugby referee, Wayne Barnes, speaking next Thursday. So please join us. The following week is something different. We're going to do a fun event with the Roundtable family of clubs. So please join us. Um, it will be an evening with a difference and people can participate. And then on the 11th of March, we've got Brad Ashton, who's a TV comedy scriptwriter and journalist, and he will be talking about scams. So I hope to see as many of you as possible um, next week and the following weeks. Thanks. Brad Ashton, I think we've had him. That ring, ring as well. Very good. Oops. Right, I shall now unmute you all so you can all clap for Chris and there. Uh... Hang on, I shall try and do this successfully. And there we go. Feel free to... Uh, I'm muted. Cheers, Chris. Thanks very much. Thank you. I did change my name after all that. <laughs> well, <that's laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're still quite sexy, Steve. Well done. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see you as soon as I can on the North Oakshire Moors Railway. Good man. Thank you.